We're reaching the top of the hour, and we're going to kick off today's uh, webinar, which is on the latest call center trends, which I think are a fascinating approach and some uh, quite interesting ones that uh, we're going to be discussing discussing today. So I'd like to, uh, I'm Josh Pierce, I'm the editor of, of Call Center Halber, and I'll be acting as the facilitator for today. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Mike Havard from uh, Ember Services for your first webinar. Mm, thank you, so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, delighted to have you uh, have you here, and uh, delighted to have you part of the, the webinar uh, program. And uh, you're going to be talking through a number of uh, a number of uh, number of trends, quite fascinating. I think one ties in with the TV program that was on. Yeah, on it does. TV uh, last night. It, it purely coincidentally, actually, that I wasn't aware that the BBC were running a whole week of programmes on robotics and automation, and there was a panorama programme on exactly that last night, and it interestingly touched on the world of contact centres and uh, will we all be replaced by machines? So I've, I've touched a little bit of that on uh, in in my my presentation. But a few other things as well. Tough brief, you know. Three three trends is what you asked me to yeah. to focus on, and uh, it's um, it was it was an interesting exercise working out which which three to focus on. Actually. Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, tricky. And uh, delighted to, to welcome back Nigel Dunn from uh, Jabra, uh, and you've moved into a swanky new headquarters here down by Heathrow. Uh, Heathrow yes, Vermont. and I must correct you already here, John. I'm afraid this is actually Langley. It's not Langley. Slough. Ah, okay. We're very, very sensitive here in the <laughs> office about this. Actually, I used to work in the floor just opposite, and we used to call this the Heathrow office. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's just and, to be. Absolutely and you've joyful. picked a, a, a few other uh, trends to uh, discuss in the uh, in the webinar. You're going to be looking, at, amongst others, the the rise of the super agent. Yes, this is a particular. Um, uh, baby of ours here at Jabra, but uh, it, it has a very specific purpose. Uh, and I'll go through perhaps some of the, 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 the bits behind that, uh, that whole concept as we go along, but uh, yeah, it's something very close to our hearts here. Excellent. And as ever, we're going to be top tips and questions from the audience. We're going to break a couple of times for those. And it wouldn't be a call center helper webinar if we didn't start off with a poll. So I'm just going to um, have a look at the trend of the move to digital. So just a question I'd like to ask of the audience. What percentage of your contact center traffic is digital? That is email, web chat, and social. I suppose text-based would be uh, more appropriate. Uh, but uh, this is we're not talking about uh, just text messages, though that would be part of it. Is it 0 to 9%? Uh, should be 10 to 19 percent, uh, 20 to 29 percent, 30 to 49 percent, or 50 percent plus. I'd just like to uh, vote on that. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you've seen any any uh, uh, research on the way it's it's moving. Uh, which which answer do you think is going to be most likely? Um, I I would imagine. So sort of, I'm thinking of the audience here yeah. a little bit, and where um, your your lovely audience might have their focus and attention in their day-to-day -day work. So I, my guess is it would be in that sort of 20 to 29 percent bracket, although it does depend on how you, you actually measure this, because if you're looking at noise around your operation and customers talking to customers, um, or the, the use of a website in a far greater capacity than you might have used it in the past for phoning, then, then it actually might be a much greater number. So I suppose it's all about definitions. And so it looks like we're coming up overall, the majority is around the 20% uh, mark there, uh, Mike. So 30% uh, are uh, between uh, 10 and 19%, 23% uh, between 20 and 29%. Quite interesting, uh, Nigel, we've got 16% of the uh, audience are now over uh, half half digital. Well, it's funny actually. I did see on LinkedIn this morning some research done by BT, um, and it actually suggested it clumped together most of those um, social activities as uh, being uh, one other form of, of getting into a contact centre. It had voice of around about 26%, and all the rest were some kind of social media. So I guess whether people are considering if email is a social media or not, but it, 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 it doesn't surprise me that there's about 50% now of digital traffic mm. coming into contact centers. So if you've got more than 50% digital traffic, if you'd perhaps like to put into the uh, chat room what sort of industry you're in or uh, why that is uh, so high, we'd be uh, fascinated, to, fascinated to see that. See that. I'm going to ask now a question. I'd like you to put the answer into the chat room to this question. In one or two words, which trend do you think will have the biggest impact 
on contact centres in the next five years. So what are, what are you saying? What trend do you think will make the biggest impact on contact centres in the next five years? Uh, Paul has said it's uh, IT or telephony. Oh, sorry, the uh, business he's in, which has generated uh, uh, over 50% is in the IT or telephony industry. Uh, Phil is uh, saying the biggest trend he thinks is social media. Carly says the biggest trend uh, she sees is self-service. Rachel says analytics and insight. Scott is saying so social media. Uh, Nick is saying in response to the earlier question about why he's got more than 50% digital traffic, uh, is providing technical support for uh, software authoring. So I suppose software is, is, is somewhat more digital. Um, uh, in, in terms of other trends, we see the shift to digital and analytics from uh, Stefan. Uh, Paul is saying mobile apps and self-service self having a big impact. Uh, 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 Jisha is saying live chat and apps are going to have a big impact. Joshua is saying um, self-service, particularly within the banking and insurance industry. Paul is saying live chat. Robin is saying self-service. So I guess we've got, uh, perhaps having asked a question on digital, we're seeing a lot of trends on, on digital coming through. Is that a surprise? No, not at all. I, it's um, playing heavily on the minds of lots of uh, service and sales professionals about how they lower their cost to serve, how are they how they take advantage of digital channels, how they don't let Amazon type models destroy mm. their business. Um, lots of thinking in that space. You know, it's it's not mm. just asking about um, you know, how do we shape the business we're in. We're asking questions about are we in a different business? And, yeah. and I think that that's all driven by this this digital thing. Uh, it's not actually the specific one that I touch on, but I think that you know a lot of that points to a trend in understanding the money, understanding yeah. where uh, cost is managed, where value is created. And, yes, and that's indeed. sort of the overarching yeah. theme, if you like, that digital and multi-channel and social fit within. Yeah. And, and Nigel, it's quite interesting. We've seen uh, just one or two mentions of social media. I think if we'd asked that question 12 months ago, we would probably seen a lot of social, social media in that. Do you think it's a sort of a social media is one that everyone got very excited about and then thinking oh, we can, can manage that? Well it, it, it's an interesting aspect isn't it because the, the, the power of social media is that one glib comment mm -hmm. about poor service can actually go through, through and, and, and be seen by hundreds of thousands of people, even millions of people very very quickly depending on what's happened and the interest levels but we've seen the power of this already with YouTube and the Dave Carroll United Affair uh, but I see it even on a daily basis, I must admit I am uh, guilty of this when I get exasperated with my supplier of broadband I will mention it on Twitter and I'll put at the company in question and they respond mm -hmm. very very quickly and I think that that's that level of responsiveness and how you take that information and then use it to, to satisfy the customer mm -hmm. is the measure of what you're going to get out of it but it comes back to Mike's point you know you can't do it just for the sake of it it has to have a purpose it has to have an outcome it has to deliver some value to the organization and to the customer indeed Brilliant. Well, we're going to jump across to uh, Mike now, and we're going to have a look at uh, the, the first of your uh, uh, three trends that you're uh, uh, going to take it, take us through. So, if we just pass the baton across to your uh, to your machine there, and can share those up on the uh, up on the screen. Great, and, thank uh, you, Shall I crack on? Yeah, if you can just pop those, uh, uh, start sharing those on the screen. I think they should be there now. Are they? Uh, I think you might just have to press the share my screen button. I did. So. Yeah, we're seeing your slides. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Yeah, it's taking a while to come through. There we go. You should have those. Um, thank you. So I, I'll I'll be quick, and and I'm really delighted to take uh, questions, tips, challenges, either you know at the end of this session or, or offline separately about any of these. It was a tough brief from John T to say, you know, could I just talk about three trends, not just three trends, but three interesting trends? <laughs> so um, I can't be the judge of interesting. I'm afraid. I'm going to leave that. Uh, leave that to you. So what I thought I would do is pick on uh, a, a trend that has a short-term implication, a mid-term and a longer-term implication, but all of those timelines are actually quite debatable, I think, because I, I do see some urgency and some practicalities right now in all of them, but I also see some, some long-term implications. Um, 
And I suppose the other thing that I that I wanted to to say is that in any of this there are no right answers, just perspectives. And those of you that are seeing a tube train here, happens to be at Charing Cross Station, can probably see it going away from you or can see it coming towards you. Whichever way you want that train to be going, uh, it will go there. And and that's the point here is that there isn't actually a right a right answer to any of this. It's great being a futurologist. You're never around to be accountable for your viewpoint. <laughs> um, but I, I do see um, evidence in the work that, that Ember is doing day to day with organizations across all sectors, public and private, um, evidence of these being three really important developments that I think the market leaders and the champions are absolutely thinking about and addressing um, right now. So uh, let me just move on to the next slide if I can. Um, seems to have stalled a little bit, so bear with me. There we go. So, um, so the three, and as I mentioned, are all, all interconnected, really. The first that I'm going to talk about is, is collaboration, and that's uh, collaboration between customers and communities and the connectedness that we're seeing as a trend and how these customers and communities and the organization are being joined up. Um, the second is about models of operation and how customer journeys are being redefined um, because of developments that I'll touch on. And the third, as I've mentioned from this Panorama program, is about the rise of the machine. And, and here it's about the ability um, and, in fact, the need to love robots. So we might have a view right now that it's, it's clunky and difficult and it's not suitable to my organization, but I've, I've got some, some data, hopefully some insight, that might challenge that view and that we actually have a need to start embracing robots here and the idea that, that all of these three actually are, are interconnected. So let me start with the fast first one. Around, around collaboration, and I think the idea here of connecting you know, me, my organization, with you, the customer, and with others, that could be other customers, partners, uh, stakeholders in, the, in this process, creates a much more powerful us. And I think when people talk collaboration, they tend to be quite narrow in their views, and that they might be thinking this is about web chat, live chat, um, this might be about Skype and, and conferencing as we are now, but I think there's a much broader definition that we need to think about here, and there's definitely a trend to embracing this. There is cost advantages to embracing it. We've seen that at GIFGAF, who have about 90%, based on latest data that I've seen, about 90% of service queries answered by other customers. Um, and it's not just about the, the cost advantage. I think there's a quality advantage here as well, because the dynamic of collaboration is changing. We're seeing organizations now able to judge their customers, not just customers judging organizations. And so when you look at what the likes of um, Uber, for example, and um, Airbnb are doing to, to get an assessment of um, the, the customer so that the, the organizations in the future can take a view on whether they want to do business with you. We've seen that in the past on, you know, for example, fraud and your ability to pay your value as a customer, but now we're just seeing it on the experience of you as a customer. And I think that's, that's really changing the dynamic of, of collaboration. And, and I think it was Gandhi that said, it's good to see ourselves as others see us. And so there is this great opportunity now to have an, uh, a, a different perspective on the organization that is about community collaborating together and again we see that in things like TripAdvisor and, and, and other such things. Um, also I think in, in collaboration terms we're, we're seeing a growth in things like visual content, visual navigation. If you look at the youngsters of today they're far more comfortable using YouTube as a search engine rather than merely Google um, in, in flat form. So I think we need to be aware of these types of, of rich content um, uh, better customer transparency, better customer connections that's, that's driving this, this whole collaboration uh, agenda. And, and we know that 53% of consumers, according to YouGov, haven't bought because of seeing negative online reviews and nearly 80%, 79% of businesses saying that reviews are important influences of behavior. So we're seeing the data stack up that says you've got to look at this broader idea of, of um, 
of collaboration and, and do it do it carefully, do it sensitively. So example implications for your operation, as I've said, might be at the, at the, at the straightforward level, web chat or live chat, but it might be about connecting employees, looking at the way you use knowledge and content tools and different types of kinetic-based interactions, et cetera, et cetera. What do you mean by kinetic-based So, you know, if you remember the matrix and the yeah. idea that you, you can have an interaction that's sort of about hand-waving or, yeah. or um, you know, looking at the developments of the new iPhone 6S yeah. due out in a couple of weeks, it's about pressure sensitivity on the screen. So yeah. greater richness in the way that you yeah. you can interact through through me. Really, so I think you know, and that just opens up collaboration opportunities far greater than than we have right now. I think the second um, uh, trend that I just wanted to touch on is about evolving um, models of of operation, and, and principally this is driven because of the opportunity to treat customer journeys um, differently, and how innovation can be a real driver to to differentiate, but also drive efficiencies and transform service experiences uh, really. So the example I use here is if you um, happen to run a motor breakdown business, what you might traditionally have been thinking about is how to create better connectivity between the customer that's broken down at the side of the road, the advisor in the call centre and the mechanic in the van going out to fix and, and how do you better connect those three parties. Well, well, actually, the customer journey nowadays should recognize that there's telematics in the car. There's a smartphone in the customer's hand that has GPS and geolocation capabilities. And so actually, you're using technology to create a far better experience where the customer hasn't got to ring anybody because the smartphone knows that the car's broken down. They can see on their map where the breakdown mechanic is and how soon he can be with you and the only intervention required is if you need to prioritize that service because you're a, a vulnerable customer and and as a side point I would say to any organization be really careful about your strategies and protocols for dealing with vulnerable customers in all sorts we mm -hmm. know that the FCA are getting hot on organizations for this and and it's the good and decent thing to do is to understand where vulnerable customers exist within mm -hmm. your within your customer base that would be a good question to ask our audience if you have any experience of in your contact center of dealing with vulnerable customers and and what safeguards and uh, advice you uh, you give to your advisors, so yeah. you'd like to put so, that into the chat room, which is callcenthelper.com forward slash chat. So we're seeing um, lots of challenges, therefore, to traditional models of operation, and, and you know, um, organizations are having to think about things like agility, like what type of partnering strategy they need in the future, whether they will need outsourcing or home working as part of their operational mix, what's the role of, of, of digital and, and the such like. So really interesting challenges to existing infrastructure and to existing models of, of doing business. And again, bringing in the last trend, looking at the way that um, different components of the organization collaborate and work effectively together. And, and the final point on that, that little list of bullets there is, is again, something we're seeing within this trend about what I would call the operationalizing of marketing and IT, you know, i.e. the budgets are shifting from marketing who might have owned the startup of social media to now look, it's over the fence into the service operation to, to deliver and run social media and engage with customers and marketing are just relegated to a campaign type role almost in, in some organizations but also I'm seeing operations and service directors with bigger IT budgets than the IT director and that's because of developments like CRM and digital and workflow and, and, and process um, tools so very interesting and again something to watch and this will clearly be different in how it manifests for every individual listening but, but that's a, a certainly another trend we see and that this whole idea of channel strategy is actually giving way to what we would you know, term customer strategies. The final trend uh, and just aware of time John T really is, is what I would call the rise of the machine and um, if anyone saw the film Ex Machina which was released earlier this year um, you, you'll know you know what, what I'm sort of alluding to here if you haven't seen the film please do it so it's a, it's a really interesting idea based essentially around the Turing test which you know Alan Turing developed this test that says when you can have an interaction with a machine and not know it's a machine you've passed the Turing test and Ex Machina as a film takes this concept a stage further and says can can we love machines and the interactions we have with them and and perhaps even more intriguingly can they love us 
and and you know we've seen uh, the, the program Humans on Channel Four, which is sort of painting a world of you know highly um, personable um, robots that that you would you know mistake to be uh, humans, and and uh, and it's creating some really I think quite provocative ideas about about the future of of interaction. However. Um, you know, is it really the future? And and what I use as a, as a, an allegory here is is the Google self-drive car. In that, you know, this is live now. It's licensed in four U.S. states. It's uh, got incredible technology going into it. So if I just put up the technology there, it's got no steering wheel, no brake pedals. It's got loads of laser beam sensors. It's got radar. It's uh, as I've said, approved in four U.S. states. It's going for approval here in the U.K. The point is, it's safe. There's only ever been two fatalities in a Google car. One is where it was rear-ended by uh, a human in a real car behind it, uh, and the second fatality was where the driver took control because he thought he could do a better job and um, and then crashed the car and killed himself. So, so we know that the Google car is safe, um, but actually Google have come out and said that it's philosophers that are now driving it, not the technologists, because actually to be a good clever road user, there are big questions of philosophy, not technology, to be answered. Like, for example, the Google car driving down a road could recognize that you are about to have a head-on crash with another car, and it would kill the four constituents in your car. So should the car actually steer onto the pavement and kill one pedestrian and save the four in your car? That, that technology can answer that question, but it's a philosophical, ethical, and moral question which is mm. now being grappled with. And, and my point behind all of this, I suppose, is that if we are getting to a stage with technology where we can ask these types of questions and we can program things to be this effective and we can envision a world where the Turing test is not just passed but, but leapt forwards from, then it's not such a massive leap to think about what that could be doing in the world of of customer service and and contact centers mm. and to think about the idea that we can have interactions that are that are good and easy and not robotic at all and what does that do for employment within this industry and what does it what does it do for for um, for service generally uh, and i think the point here and this is looking a little further out but Embracing robots in service is, is inevitable, actually, and I think that it won't be long before we don't just trust robots, but actually we have to love them, and, and, and that's a pretty provocative statement, I think, and, and, the, and there's two reasons for that, I, that I would say that. The first is that the tech and the intelligence is becoming more reliable and trustworthy, and you've got organizations like Google and Nuance and others that are investing heavily in making this good and fail-safe and brilliant and clever and, and putting in loads and loads of, of intelligence into, into the system. But the second, and I think this is a really important point that a lot of people miss about what, what's happening here, is that ultimately we'll have no choice. And the reason is, and this is the big trend if you like, and also the big, the big worry, is that there are increasingly fewer people to care for our retirees and fewer workers out there to fund them. So if you look at at the data on this, and there's classic support ratio type type data around, which looks at the number of workers uh, to retirees or beneficiaries as a ratio. You can see that in the U.S. in 1960, there were 5.1 to every 5.1 workers to every um, retiree, um, and in, by 2030, that would have dropped to about 2.2. And in fact, in the U.K., it was about 4.3 in 1970, dropping to about 2.4 in 20. 50, far more pronounced and even more critical in places like Japan and China, where in Japan in 1970 there were 8.5 uh, uh, workers to every retiree, in 2050 that will drop to about 1.2. So with falling falling birth rates around around the world, you know, countries like Japan, Russia, Singapore, and Australia trying to incentivize birth rates. Um, China has passed the peak of 19-year-olds, so it's now an aging population. It, it, it's becoming actually a really interesting trend and dynamic about the nature of work, the nature of care, the nature of flexibility, the nature of attracting people into employment, how the elderly looked after. And, and the, the, you know, the, the, the brains on this, far, far bigger brains than I would ever bring to it, have basically concluded there's only really three options for, for tackling this. One is extending the retirement age so that we keep workers working for longer, and that clearly is politically rather challenging. Um, the second option is to have more children, which is environmentally and socially perhaps more 
uh, irresponsible, and the third is to substitute the care and support roles with robots. And, and out of the three options, it really does fall down to the development of robots to be looking after not just our elderly, but also our customers into the future as there are fewer workers to support that. So I think that's really interesting. There's also a piece of research that, that came out very recently from Oxford University that categorized 700 jobs by their propensity to be taken over by robots mm -hmm. at some point and they had a whole range of criteria that and you can go online and look this up and put your own job in um, but let me let me help you out here because <laughs> out of the 700 um, where uh, they were all ranked in court, in, according to propensity to be robotized I suppose uh, number one uh, on that list was telemarketers um, and clearly telemarketing isn't that far from from customer service and in fact I'll tell you exactly how far it is customer service advisors are at number 39 out of 700 so so clearly we we are um, so they have a call center manager on that type? They, 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 they will certainly have uh, operational managers in that list so go, go and have a look it's um, it's on, on the web, just type in Oxford University uh, robotics and jobs and you'll, you'll find it, I'm sure. So, you know, it, the evidence is there. I think the social trends are there. The need is there. Um, by 2017, you uh, was that only one third of service interactions involved human. And, and that was sort of getting close with your survey earlier about the role of digital within contact centers. So, so actually, it's happening now. This isn't so futuristic. It's how we define robot, I suppose, is that... Is the key question here? So, you know, in conclusion on this, you know, what does better machines and customer service means? Well, it means the ability to codify things like care and negotiation and, and complex um, complex issues. It means you can be more predictive, and intuitive. You can apply insight automatically. A lot of real time data. You can do away with things like ID and V processes because the robots will know you and they'll understand you and probably what you want even before you've articulated it. So it's thinking about these types of ideas, I think, is a really interesting and important trend, not just for the future, but for how you're thinking about things now. So just, just by conclusion, um, I suppose in reading the future, there are four four things we shouldn't forget about today, um, uh, and, and, I, and I quote these a lot really because I think they are important to everything we do. The first is making sure that you're looking for positive behavior change in all those you engage. You know, mm -hmm. Getting customers to do something differently and positively is, is the way that value is created. Um, you've got to do this in a spirit of trust and transparency. Mm -hmm. Nigel made a very good point about you know one gripe, one disaffected customer can become a million people mm -hmm. not not choosing you and I think so everything you do is open to scrutiny and I think you know we need to be aware of that now. Um, a lot of organizations don't really have a clear guiding star, guiding north star on what they want their service experience and vision to be. Mm -hmm. What is it that is you're differentiated, do you want to wow, do you want to make it easy? I think that wherever we go with robots or collaboration we need that um, and the point I made at the beginning is sort of understanding leveraging and communicating customer value and the value of engagement. It's got to be worthwhile for the companies that are investing in, sorry, for the boards that are investing in their companies and in their organizations. They've got to know, is it worth it? And what does better look like? Um, so um, hopefully that's been of use um, and interesting. I suppose my final point on, on engagement of the future when we're talking about collaboration tools and technology and robots is, is just to think about what value really means. And, and someone once told me the other day that, you know, it, when you have 10,000 photos, you value them far less than when you have 10 photos. Mm. And yeah. perhaps think about engagements in the same way. You can have a thousand engagements via social and digital very easily, but perhaps one conversation can mean far more in the right hands with the right person. Yeah, oh, that's fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, insight there. That uh, certainly might make me thought uh, if we do go to uh, robots, uh, will some of our management roles then be uh, managing teams of robots, which I think is interesting. So I can fully see doing uh, uh, quality reviews of uh, asking the robot, how would you have handled that call differently? And uh, uh, all sorts of coaching issues. I guess motivation is probably not the same, whether we have to still have games and uh, incentives to the robots to keep them uh, on top form is uh, quite interesting. I suspect there's plenty of people out there right now thinking they're being managed by robots, yeah. alone <laughs> worrying about managing them in the future. Yeah. Right. Salary review time should be quite good as well. <laughs> I quite, quite like the idea of that. Yes, I'd like a few more votes, please. <laughs> uh, so, got an interesting question then. So, uh, following on from that, um, very easy to be flippant. When do you believe 
that the robots will take over from customer service. Do you think they already have? Do you think it's likely to happen within one year, within five years, within ten years? Or do you think it will never, never take place? So um, uh, be quite interesting. I guess in some ways we've got robots in some functions, like for instance self-service is a sort of robot, robotized what's my bank balance. Um, Nigel, which, which do you think is going to be the most common uh, answer back from the audience to this question? I think there is going to be a bigger trend towards automation, robotics, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think the whole idea that on a, a simple smartphone, uh, you can actually get most of the information to transact normal banking <laughs> uh, uh, things without ever having to walk into a branch. And in fact, I can't remember the last time I walked into my branch. Uh, I couldn't tell you which is my local branch of uh, HSBC Bank. And I certainly haven't walked into it for a long time. And I think most of it now can be done through automation. And very rarely do I have to call them up about things. And generally, that's for a more complicated thing. So it's, it's all about us. And, uh, and, I, and I think that the banking industry has benefited from that. And I think customers have benefited from that. So I think there, there is a tremendous role for technology to play here. Well, let's have a look at the uh, results. Uh, we've got 9% say they already have. Uh, we've got 32% believe it's going to happen within five years. 43% uh, by far the biggest majority is 10 plus years, and only 16% uh, believe it will never, never happen. So, Mike, is that sort of the right sort of horizon you think? Um, it's it's a, it's a, it's an interesting spread actually. I, I, I'm intrigued by your use of the word only 16%. I mean that is nearly a fifth of people yes. believing that it will never happen, which is larger than than I thought actually. I think there's personally I think there's evidence of it around now. I think it will become transformational in the five to ten year window. So. Um, it would be great to have a, a debate with the those in the the never camp, actually, just to sort of understand where where their views on this are. But well, no, really interesting spread. I think I'm probably more towards the uh, the never piece. I think there'll be piece, piece, pieces that can be uh, uh, robot robotized, but I think you know the uh, you know the, the human vocabulary is so wide. Just understanding human language uh, will get will get there, and we'll probably get to a point where I guess you you know. Someone will have something a bit like the, the you know, my dog, that uh, you know can follow you around. It's got sort of some degree of intelligence, but uh, you know, would I put it on the telephone? It's probably, uh, probably not. Uh, you know, thirty-word vocabulary, you know, okay, pro probably a bit better from computers. But I'm a bit more, a bit more skeptical of that uh, side. But I think it's uh, uh, certainly it's a trend that's likely to come, uh, uh, come through more often. Well, let's have a have a look now. We're going to go do some top tips and questions from the audience. There's a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates for the best tip. We've also got, uh, uh, Mike has donated a copy of uh, United Breaks Guitars, which is, uh, you're very friendly with Dave Carroll, who wrote that uh, story. So we've got a copy of that uh, book to uh, uh, give away as well, which will, be, uh, which will be great. So let's have a look at um, some of the uh, tips and questions that have been coming through from the, uh, from the audience. I've lost my mouse. Here we go. And uh, let's have a look at the uh, first uh, one that's come through. It's an audience, uh, audience question. And uh, let's go through here. There we go. Uh, so the question is from Paul53, is there a pull or push to use new technology channels? For instance, are customers using alternative options because they have to or because they want to? Uh, Nigel, have you got a thought on that one? That's uh, that is an exceptionally profound question, actually, because I think that, that there is a bit of two ways on this. I do believe that it, it's a pull mechanism, mainly. A lot of companies are looking to reduce cost, find ways that they can automate the processes, uh, but with a genuine approach of making things easier for customers as well. And I also think that in this fast society in which we live, to have at your fingertips on a smartphone or a laptop the ability to transact most of the things that you would normally do uh, without having to interact or walk into the floor of a bank or an insurance company. I think it's also profoundly good for the customers and we all demand it. You know, We have a lifestyle that says we have an hour for lunch and by the time we go home the banks are shut. So we need to do something. Sorry, I'm picking on banks quite a lot but it's a, it's a good example of it. 
So I do think that there is a push and pull to this, but I do believe that there's more of a pull because there's more interest at, at heart for the companies to do this. Yeah, Matthew, in response to your question about vulnerable uh, customers, says that uh, our agents are empowered to make that decision on prioritizing uh, vulnerable customers right. down at the agent level. Uh, Rachel has put an opinion. I think businesses are, uh, are just not ready to adopt the technology. The basics need to work first. So I guess that's the, the well, I, I, and that, that I think is a really good point. And, it, and I'm going to tie that and the earlier question together, actually, because um, the the Times Tech 100 list came out a couple of weeks ago. Number one on that list is a company called V Interactive. It grew 300% last year, and all it does essentially is helps. Um, customers have better online journeys so that they don't drop out and it and it sort of works to predict and understand when customers are dropping out from online journeys now yeah. at one level that type of technology shouldn't need to exist because it should be so intuitive and easy and and everything works and so yeah. I think that was it Rachel I think that was a, uh, a a very good point that is you know actually if things just did work then there's a lot of the stuff we do wouldn't be necessary um, but unfortunately the world is in such a way that you know things don't always work and it's not always smooth and easy and that's a great opportunity for technology to step in. Indeed, we've had a few more comments on that. Uh, Joshua says, more specifically, people within each business uh, are the resistance in my experience. So I guess that's an mm -hmm. interesting challenge there. And Robin says, I believe many or most of the functions will be handled via self-service in the short term. However, for the truly complex issues, a person is Required, so I guess that's pointing more towards automation than uh, uh, robotics. Let's have a look. Uh, Rachel's got a tip saying to drive business efficiencies, automation needs to happen and should, but business needs need to be more agile in their technology uh, adoption. Great point. True to say. Uh, Rachel's uh, asked a question: How do you see robots managing multi-layered servicing? Start of ten, Mike. Gosh, um, again, a, a good question. I see multi-layered servicing. I'm not quite sure what I understand multi-layered servicing uh, to be, but if if it is about um, the dealing with with complex scenarios that have you know a multitude of factors within it, then one would argue that they should be better able to do it as long as they are connected. And I think I suppose part of the issue here is that. What a human has is the ability to to adapt and apply conscious thinking and to uh, interpret nuance, which I think is very important. And at the moment, that's quite difficult for machines. So uh, there is, you know, one argument that says, assuming all the data is there, then a machine codified in the right way should be better at it because it would understand the complete scenario. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think I'd like to understand what that question is really asking, and then I might have a better stab at answering it. So, Rachel, if you perhaps want to put a bit more uh, detail on that, would be useful. And we've got a, a, a final question for this part, uh, which Carly says: How do we encourage customers to self-serve more, i.e., use a knowledge base rather than rather than calling? I guess this may be uh, looking at it from a company mm. perspective. I want my customers to self-serve more because I can save money. Mm. Uh, Nigel, your, your thoughts on? You could encourage well, I think Mike's point about the Times tech list and a, a company that's simply doing navigation on these systems being top of it is a really profound point because I, I obviously, uh, as a customer, sometimes are very, very put off by the layers of information that you have to wade through in order to get to a specific point uh, on your customer journey and experience. And sometimes the navigation of these systems are pretty poor pretty poor. And then to the point where you get to the exasperation that you need to speak to a human being, of course finding that point where it says contact us is actually quite difficult sometimes. And again, I go back to my raw brand supplier, it's actually about the last screen you ever come to. And by that point, your blood is boiling and so whoever is going to get that call is actually going to get a very angry individual. So I, I do think that it's incumbent on companies to make this technology as simple and as intuitive as possible because at the end of the day, the, the person who's calling in is not a robot. And, mm -hmm. and that's the, the most mm -hmm. important profound message is that the customer experience is all about a human being. And so you've got to design it with that human being in mind. I think too often we see the systems designed for the 
purpose of the company because it suits the company's needs and I think technology for its own sake is It's tied in very much with that. We've uh, asked the question in the <laughs> chat room of do you personally enjoy calling contact centres? And uh, been running that just in the in the background there. Some quite uh, fascinating results have come through on that uh, on that poll. And I think this uh, this ties in very much with the ease your your point about making it easy to, to do so. Uh, Four percent say yes, I enjoy calling call centres. Eleven percent say usually. Forty percent sometimes. And forty four percent of our audience say no. So mm -hmm. right, that's kind of um, uh, tends to indicate there is a, a sort of a a desire to self-serve rather than call in. Uh, I, th I think it's a desire to be listened to and a desire to get access to and get issues resolved. And, and I tell you what, the biggest desire is is to not have the problem in the first place, right? To not have the need in the first place. I think Jeff Bezos called it right you know, after the acquisition of Zappos, saying, "Look, I didn't buy Zappos for their service culture. Right? What I want in Amazon is, you know, an obsession with things just working." Mm -hmm. And and if someone has to pick up the phone or email me, it's it's rude. It's an interruption to their day. So let's not impose that on customers. So I think that should be the starting point: is to give people no reason to call you unless mm -hmm. there is value within it for you or for them. I mm -hmm. think is is the point. And there are occasions when you do need that conversation. But but yeah, it's um, it, you know, and, and, the, and the, it brings back to my earlier point about you know the quote from Gandhi, which is saying mm -hmm. that you know the biggest driver of change is to see yourself as others. See you, you know, ring your own operations, use your own website, get your board doing that. That's the, one of the best ways of getting them to invest, right? Is to get them experiencing what you're really like. And um, and, it, and what we're seeing here is nearly half of the people on this on this webinar saying they don't really like what they are. Mm. Yeah. That's worrying. So I think that's a good time to jump across to uh, you, Nigel. And uh, I think you've got three more trends you wanted to uh, talk about uh, today. So if you'd like to uh, pop this, those slides up on your uh, on your screen, yeah, I, we can, uh... I'll I'll start actually going from that particular point that was raised there, um, mm -hmm. and about whether people like to call in call centres because I have my own personal experience of this of actually calling into uh, a, 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 addressing a, a group of 300 or so very prominent collaboration stroke. Mm -hmm call center resellers on behalf of a major manufacturer in London. And I opened the conversation for my five minutes of pitch, if you like, to say, who here likes to call up call centers? And in amongst all this audience that had sold billions of pounds worth of infrastructure, call analytics, CRM, process management, voice recognition, voice recording, all the technology you could possibly imagine, four of them raised their hands up to say they enjoy the call, call centers. And my point was, well, then you've rapidly failed at what you do for a living because it's all about the customer experience. And for my money, uh, I, I think that you know the points that Mike has been discussing and particularly about the trends on technology are absolutely true. And this whole industry is is going to go through quite a revolution over a pe period of time because it needs to, and it needs to help the customer in its process. But there are some facts and figures here. By any estimations, there is a minimum 5,000 what we could call contact centers in the UK. I have one here of just three people that answer technical calls. That qualifies, to my mind, as a contact center, just as uh, some of these big ones that you see uh, of many thousands. Uh, if you put all of those people into the box and, uh, and estimate the numbers, whether it be in local authorities or businesses, there is a minimum 750,000 of these people in existence, up to a, a million UK contact centre agents uh, working every single day. And they are in, uh, you know, employing a great deal of people who are working between 7 and 10 every day. Uh, usually they're open seven days a week and often all through the year. I mean, it's an enormous number of people. When you think about it, if you call it down at the low side that 20 people call, uh, have 20 interactions per week, you're talking about 20 million contacts per week in the UK going on every single week. Mm -hmm. That makes these people far more important than the chief executive that those companies will ever be mm -hmm. because they are huge influencers of that company's brand. They are brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, when we get to the point that we were talking about earlier about decision-making issues and the multi-layered type of uh, question, I think it comes back down to this point that says that the, the worst thing that could possibly happen in a call center is get to a, 
uh, all through these uh, technology trees and arrive at an individual who's prepared to take your call. And that individual is not either interested to help or can't help because they don't have the knowledge or the information uh, or the empowerment to help uh, at the end of it. And that's all about the customer experience. So actually, I think there will be a trend away from just raw KPIs and raw you know, how long did it take to get rid of this person off the call, to actually, was that person satisfied when they called in? Uh, did they get an outcome to what they were doing? And that leads to perhaps the biggest trend of all that should outcome on this, and it goes back to Mike's point, which is the value to the organization, which is generally some kind of increase in profitability or sales as a result. And I think we go back to some of the old adages. That uh, and I think the last time I was on actually, John T, we had that news story of the day that said, on average, at calling into some large call centres, if you're in the calling up for sales, you were answered within a minute. If you called up for customer service and technical support, typically you're on the line for about 20 minutes, and it was all about you know the ratio of staff to to the uh, to the outcome. And I think that, that we forget that it costs roughly five times as much to generate a new customer than to keep an old customer. And so customer service still is ranked number one, and it's got to be the biggest trend in this industry, is what is that customer experience? And as uh, coming back to many of the points that Mike made, is that there's no point investing in technology if you don't know what the outcome's going to be. And the outcome needs to be some kind of benefit and experience to the customer at the end of the day. And that will enhance your brand image, it will increase your sales, and it will decrease the costs over time if you get it right. And perhaps coming back to Shep's earlier point, combination of technology and people will get it right. Now, we, this research that I put up is the old stuff because this was back 10, 15 years ago that said, if I get my bad experience, my broadband provider, I'll go and tell the nine people in the office here, you know what, don't call that provider because they gave me rubbish service. Well, we now know, through the Dave Carroll example, for example, it can extend to millions. And I think it's the last count of last year, earlier this year, 15 million people had downloaded and looked at that video that he made of the three songs he made about his bad experience. 15 million people. Four days after the second song was made and went viral, 10% uh, was knocked off the value of United Airlines stock. Slightly coincidental because a few other airlines lost some money that particular day. But to put it into real figures, that was $180 million lost. One man, one complaint. Mm -hmm. And what compensation did you receive from the company? $3,000. $180 million lost, $3,000 paid. You know, we've got to get that ratio right. We've got to understand what those outcomes are because the power is there for people to do it. Something that Jabra did this year, uh, we tried to put it back that this, the agents should be on the pedestal. They should be the most motivated people in your company. They should be, for argument's sake, actually some of the most empowered people in your company because they have the ability to turn a customer complaint round to something of great advantage to the organization. And those people are extremely good at it get great points for their company. Those people are bad of it. Guess what? We don't call them a second time. We don't give them much of a chance. I had the good fortune of doing some of the judging of call center agents for the South uh, Eastern Call Center Association a few months back. And some of the things we got back from that inspired us to make, come out with our super agent program, which said, send us in all the things that you do, great. Show us in in any format you want. And we'll judge it at the end of it, along with Red Letter Day, uh, Days and uh, Contact Center Magazine, as it happened. And we actually got some phenomenal responses. And some of the companies that came in, the, the joy in their business was great, but the participation of everybody in the organization through videos and all sorts of things was just wonderful. And we were glad to do it because these people are the top of the, the tree. There's a wonderful book that if you ever get hold of it, it's now about 20 years old, written by a chap called Adrian Birch, called The Organization on Its Head. And he argues very strongly that says that the number of people who interact with customers down at the lowest level are the least empowered in your company. Go back up to the tree to the chief executive. He is the most empowered individual in your company. He probably speaks to no more than one customer a day, if you're lucky. Guess what? You've got the priorities wrong. And I have a working example of this when I worked for Genesis Conferencing, where we were finding that we didn't get a great deal of complaints coming in, but our investor call 
uh, rates were going down and we were losing some money on it. When we actually investigated a little bit more, the agents were saying when the calls came in to complain about a lost call or a disrupted call, they couldn't do anything about it other than to say, sorry about that. So what we did was to give them an empowerment to say, you can give up to £1,500 credit off the next call there and then if you feel it's necessary. We gave away not a great deal of money, but the business was stabilized and eventually began to grow, and the agents were powerfully happy uh, afterwards. So there is some learning there to be done. Yes, uh, if you get all this right, well, of course, uh, you know, all of this uh, technology and the trends that we were seeing, and in fact, the poll today was showing that digital now is, is very strong, and that information that I had this morning was 26% still prefer the voice uh, as being their uh, main interaction, but fast coming up is all the digital technologies. People want quick solutions, they want good solutions that give them the results and that good outcome. And whatever way you can provide it, actually I think customers will put up with it so long as it's good and it does what they, they really want. So I think that there is going to be a trend towards this multi-channel. Digital is going to be profoundly important in all of this, but it, there's an onus on us all to get it right to make sure the customer experience is good. The other thing I would say is, again, but going back to this agency idea and the motivation, uh, I, I think there were some TV programs about a Welsh contact centre not so long ago that actually gave us all a bad name. And uh, uh, being a Welshman, I was particularly at the heart of that. It, it, it personally affronted me. Um, there is no doubt that the working conditions in certain call centres are not particularly what they require. And guess what? You will breed unmotivated uh, people are doing that and there's nothing worse for us all to call in and speak to people who really don't enjoy their job. A lot of people are very dissatisfied with the technology they use and I think we found through some research we did a few years back as Jabra, we found that 67 people were particularly unhappy with the kinds of tools they were given to do their jobs on a daily basis. And if you think about it, the average call center where all those billions of pounds have been spent over the last few years, guess what? The headsets typically are 10 years old. So, you know, those guys aren't being treated with the best of the technologies. So I think the trends of technology are that the headset and the audio experience actually is pretty profound. It's what communicates between the individuals on the telephone call. Get that bit right, and you know what? The rest of it might become a little bit easier. So uh, going back to my, my point that I made all along um, about the, the cost of losing customers, perhaps the best strategy of all is to have a a satisfied customer and if we remember that in all that we do I am pretty sure as, as Mike quite rightly says the Gandhi quote comes right to the forefront put yourself in the customer's shoes more often than not you will actually find that that's a different kind of experience to the one you're trying to create so modify it to make sure the customer's happy so that, that's my, my little lot on it and perhaps I'm arguing slightly against the robotics all the way down the line I'm not sure <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, thank you for that, Nigel. I think certainly the, you know, customer service is the best business strategy of, of all. I guess it's, you know, is customer service the new marketing? Because we see companies spending huge amounts of money on on marketing and not really uh, realizing that, you know, perhaps uh, investing that in customer service might del deliver a better return. I think it goes back to that point about it does cost five times as much to get a new customer as to keep an old customer, and we do see an awful lot. And there's some very clever TV marketing going on, you know, involving various animals and opera singers, uh, telling us how good those particular products are. But the definition in that particular industry is how to keep a customer, not how to win one, because uh, it is really at the renewal time where those customers are always susceptible to the next best advert. And that's why we've got a lot of switching websites around today. The churn in those industries is very, very high indeed. Really, the strategy should be equally to keep the customers to find one. Interesting. Well, there's a question in from uh, Paul, who uh, ties in with your comments about uh, negative uh, feedback. He asked the question, are customers more likely to give feedback if they've had poor service? than those who've had good service. Mike, I don't know if you've got any, any take on yeah, so it, it, propensity it, it, to need no, feedback. Good, good question. And um, uh, researchers have known for a long time that you need to be very careful of bias within, within feedback and surveys and voice of customer type 
feedback is is no different and so what you would typically get is a is a classic u curve so you would have a high propensity to give feedback if you are highly satisfied or highly dissatisfied and the issue is getting the middle majority mm. to provide any useful feedback um, I think again you know when when you said pick out three trends there were lots of others that uh, I was I was intrigued about about focusing on them and one of them just to touch on it is is what's happening with voice of customer because there is a definite thought that says um, it won't be long before voice of customer as a tool set as a feedback mechanism is outdated and redundant actually because you should have right now enough data about your customers and how they feel about you without having mm -hmm. to ask them and actually if you think about the mechanics and the bias and the unreliability of asking somebody a view actually it's, it's a pretty weak science to be honest mm. I'm a scientist by background so I'd hope yeah. to have some understanding of this and um, I think that you know I'm not saying every organization's there right now but a lot of organizations have through through voice analytics through data through usage patterns from their customers they should have really good insight as to what their customers think and feel and they should be using that data rather than necessarily having to go in out and interrupt their day and ask them for so I've gone off on a slightly different tangent but the answer is um, yes you tend to get more feedback from satisfied and dissatisfied than you do from the middle middle majority. And I'm guessing it's probably leans more to the dissatisfied I think about when I leave feedback on on TripAdvisor, it tends to be if I've had a really bad experience, I'm you know I'm compelled to almost do it in the restaurant. Uh, the good ones, I sort of mean to and never never quite get round to because the compulsion isn't necessarily. Yeah, it's not that's not necessarily how the stats line okay. up actually. Yeah, again, about, it's context context thing. dependent. Yeah. If you look at something like TripAdvisor, actually the the, the vast majority are coming from highly satisfied. Okay. That's, that's absolutely true, and I, I think there's a growing trend in the contact center industry as well. And I, I think anybody who has perhaps been a Vodafone customer, if you call into the 191 service, at the end of it, almost immediately, you put the phone down, you are prompted by text to see whether you are satisfied with that call or not. And it, 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 to get to the point of the contextual thing, if you've just had a great experience, that's the time to hit the customer. They'll give you great feedback at that particular moment, tick all the right boxes. Equally. That if they've had a bad experience, if it was pretty much uh, as you'd expected, perhaps you just ignore the whole thing. And I think my, Mike's point is, is is right. The middle ground is is where all the real data is, because that really tells you uh, how you're performing, perhaps on average as, a, as an organisation. There's always going to be the outlying bits uh, on there. I, I'm tickled pink, actually. I still read every comment that comes back into our contact mm. centre, and it's not a big call contact centre, so I can get around them each month. And they mention people by name, and it just makes me chuckle because that that is just <laughs> such a nice thing to, to have. And we do get the odd uh, bad one, and that is one we we all pounce on it. We find the individual's name, we track him down, and we then go and give him a call and say, "What was your real problem? What can we do to help?" Because you just get avid about this this whole process. We'll be too big sometime to to be able to do that, but uh, it just tickles me pink to see it now. Well, we've got a comment in from uh, Rachel in uh, Nigel, to response to your thing about the core contact center KPI. She says, core contact center KPIs drive the opposite culture of good customer experience. How do you go about changing this perception? So, uh, good, and I think I know what she's referring to in that um, <clears throat> there's this old idea of what gets measured gets done. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, you know, I, I'm sort of I'm, like I'm, I'm defaulting, I'm defaulting to I'm defaulting to Gandhi and Einstein here. <laughs> so it was Einstein that said that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that uh, you can count um, can be counted, or the counts can't be counted. And and I think that that's what um, Rachel might be alluding to: that sometimes there are bad metrics, and if you have the wrong metrics that are driving behaviour, clearly the wrong behaviours uh, are driven. So. I think I think my my response to Rachel would be I think she touches on a a true and genuine and pervasive point about KPIs, but the but the real opportunity is to get the right ones that drive the right behaviours and and I would argue that that's really all about outcomes, and and the real and only truly um, sustaining new outcomes are are where I brought it back to behaviour four behaviours, can you get someone to buy more from you can you get them to stay get them to stay with you longer. Can you get them to be an advocate and tell others, thereby lowering your cost of sale? And can you get them to be less demanding? 
right? Use a different channel, stop calling me, yeah. whatever. Four behaviors is all you need to worry about. And if you align your key KPIs and metrics and the way you manage your staff to trying to drive those changes in behavior, I, I personally haven't ever seen that go awry in terms of driving wrong behaviors. Wonderful. So excellent words of advice there. Unfortunately, we have timed out now. So uh, in one or two words, if you could type into the chat room, what did you like best about the webinar? You can get copies of the slides and also a replay uh, later on this afternoon from callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. We're back on Thursday where we're going to be looking at the best ways to improve customer satisfaction. I'd just like to thank our two speakers. Mike, thank you for joining us for your first webinar. Really yes, enjoyed thank it. Thank you, John. Uh, Nigel, also thank you for joining us again. Thanks very much, John. Fascinating Jonty. insight as ever. And uh, to everyone in the audience, if you'd like to complete the survey, indeed, I read every single comment everyone makes on the <laughs> surveys as well. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you online again on Thursday. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.